Hello, uh, my name is Richard Rothstein. I'm the author of a book, The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. It describes the many policies that federal, state, and local governments uh, pursued to ensure that we uh, be a segregated society, really an apartheid society. The policies were unconstitutional, a violation of the Fifth Amendment on the part of the federal government and the Fourteenth Amendment on the part of the state and local governments. We have a myth, a national myth, that uh, this is de facto segregation, something that just happened by private activity. Uh, in fact, uh, that myth is just a myth. The reality is that the government at all levels uh, created and ensured and enforced racial segregation uh, in the mid 20th century with power policies that were so powerful that they still um, uh, maintain and, and create the segregated patterns, really the apartheid patterns that we have in this country today. These policies were unconstitutional, as I said, and because they were unconstitutional, they um, require us as American citizens to remedy them. These are civil rights violations that uh, if we take our uh, responsibilities to the citizens seriously, we uh, uh, cannot continue to tolerate. Uh, I'm working now uh, on a new book, a sequel to The Color of Law, that describes what local citizens can do to redress segregation. Uh, I don't believe that the national uh, political will exists to do it at a national level, but there are many, many things that local citizens can do to redress the segregation that our government at all uh, levels has created. Yeah, that's, that's great. I'm looking forward to the new book because this one was uh, incredibly informative and, and uh, a great read. Um, I'm looking forward to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe you could give us a, a short kind of brief history of kind of um, public housing and how that um, contributed to the segregation I will. Can I interrupt for a minute to say something about the new book? One of the things, and I'm, I'm begging for the help of you and your um, library attendees, one of the things that the new book is, a, is describing is a program of the Ohio Housing Finance Agency in the um, 1980s, particularly, uh, that uh, provided a subsidy to whites who would move into black neighborhoods and African-Americans who would move into white neighborhoods. This was a Cleveland Heights program that the Ohio Housing Finance Agency was pursuing. The available documentation that I have um, been able to find goes up to 1989. And then the record disappears, the historical record disappears. And if any of your attendees and know of um, the history of that uh, program and that agency, how long it lasted after 1989, 1989, what happened to it. I will uh, use that in the new book. It's uh, something that I'm very, very interested in. Okay, um, your question again, I'm sorry. Um, yes, and I will get the word out about that. Uh, we have a couple of local historians who probably would be very interested in uh talking to or sending they can they can communicate with me directly about that excellent um so yeah my initial question was maybe just a, a brief history of public housing okay. and the agencies that kind of participated at the federal level well um let me begin by telling a cleveland story uh, and it, it's one i recounted in the in the color of law um in the mid 20th century, uh, there were many integrated urban neighborhoods in this country, many more than there are today. For the simple reason that uh, we were a manufacturing economy, factories had to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals to get their parts and ship their final products. And workers, both black and white in those factories had to be able to walk to work or take short street car rides. So we had many more integrated neighborhoods than we have today. The great African-American poet, novelist, playwright, Langston Hughes, described in his autobiography how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood, not how we think of downtown Cleveland today. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. He said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. This was an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. The very first 
agency uh, ever to build public housing in this country was the Public Works Administration in the 1930s, during the New Deal and the Depression, Great Depression, the Roosevelt Administration. It built the very first public housing in this country. And everywhere it built it, it segregated it, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. For example, in those integrated neighborhoods that I described before. One of them was the neighborhood of Cleveland where Langston Hughes was a teenager and went to high school. It was an integrated neighborhood, but the Public Works Administration and, uh, built two projects in that neighborhood, one for whites, one for African-Americans, uh, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. And subsequent housing agencies pursued the same policy of segregated public housing, creating segregation <clears throat> where it hadn't previously existed. Uh, during the New Deal and the Depression, public housing was the most desirable housing available. It wasn't subsidized. We had a 25% unemployment rate in the Depression. Public housing was for the 75% who had good jobs, who had stable incomes, who could afford to pay the full cost of the housing and the rent. So there were both whites and blacks who had uh, these qualifications and could afford to live in public housing. Remember, we had a housing shortage. There was very little housing construction going on. But the federal government uh, segregated that housing, both for black and white workers who were paying the full cost of the housing in their rent, creating separate projects for blacks and whites. And Cleveland was not the only place. So, you know, in my book, I like to describe where I can uh, some self-satisfied smug places that uh, maybe think they're better than Cleveland. Um, one of them I talked about was uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The area between Harvard and MIT, maybe you've heard of those institutions, um, called the Central Square neighborhood, was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s, about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood and the federal government created two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. This policy continued through the 1930s and 40s. During World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in, in the war industries. And if the government wanted the tanks and the jeeps and the aircraft and the ships to be built, it had to create housing for these workers everywhere it did. It created segregated housing, separate projects for blacks, separate projects for whites. These workers working in the same war plants uh, creating segregation. Frequently, these were communities where the war plants were located that had no African Americans living there prior to the war. So that when they were assigned to segregated housing, the government was creating segregated neighborhoods for the first time. Yes, that's, that's interesting. Then you also mentioned in the book this um, how single family homes kind of took over from public um, housing. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, once the highways were built and uh, the factories could move out to rural areas no longer needed to be located in the deep water ports and railroad terminals, um, uh, the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration embarked on a program to move all the white families in those urban areas out of uh, both public housing and the uh, private apartments into single family homes in all white suburbs. And these surround every metropolitan area in the country. Um, these uh, single family home suburbs that the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration built for whites only. It's a racially explicit program. Uh, in the color of law, uh, I describe uh, one of them, but only one. There were hundreds and hundreds of these in every metropolitan area, but it's well known, Levittown, east of New York City. Um, the builder, Levitt, was a bigot. He wouldn't have sold to an African-American if he had a choice, he bragged about it. Uh, but uh, it was 17,000 homes in a rural area east of New York City. No bank would be crazy enough to uh, lend him the money to do such a thing. The only way he could build that suburb, and this was true of developers all over the country, was to um, go to the Federal Housing and Veterans Administrations submit his plans for the development, the, the architectural design, the materials we to use every detail, including a federally required commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. 
the federal government even uh, require the Levitt to place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. Um, federal requirement wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats. The uh, uh, Federal Housing Administration had an underwriting manual distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to um, evaluate the application of builders for homes and um, uh, for developments that would get federal bank guarantees. The manual said you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development for all whites. It was going to be located near where African-Americans were living because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. Um, this notion of, of de facto segregation is utter nonsense. It makes uh, Levitt, as I said, if left to his own devices, wouldn't have sold to an African-American, but he wasn't left to his own devices. Um, the only way he could build it was a federal bank loan, that federal guaranteed bank loan. And if the federal government had fulfilled its constitutional responsibilities, its minimal constitutional responsibilities, by telling Levitt that we don't care if you're a bigot or not, if you want a federal guarantee for your bank loan, you have to sell homes on a non-discriminatory basis, Levittown and all these other suburbs around the country would be now integrated communities, which both blacks and whites could have afforded at the time they were built. In all of these suburbs, they went for about, in today's money, $100,000. Any worker, black or white, with a job in the post-war economy, and virtually all of them did, could afford a home in these suburbs. Um, for for uh, veterans, and this was a primary uh, a target of these uh, uh, programs, veterans didn't even need a down payment. So the homes were easily affordable. Today, those homes are not affordable to um, uh, working class families of either race. In Levittown, they sell for $300,000, dollars $500,000. Uh, some parts of the country, they're a million dollars or more. So the white families who bought those homes with this federal guarantee in these all white single family uh, suburbs gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the equity appreciation in the value of their homes. They used it to send their children to college. They used it to take care of perhaps temporary emergencies, maybe medical emergency, they, unemployment. Uh, they uh, used it to um, uh, finance uh, their own retirements and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. We passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968 that said in effect to African-Americans, okay, you, know, you can move to these places now. You can no longer be prohibited from doing so, but they're unaffordable now to working class families of either race. So in order to uh, remedy that, uh, violate that constitutional violation, the federal government or the, the, the descendants of the builders the firms that built these places and the realtors who sold them and the banks that financed them are going to have to subsidize African-Americans to move into places uh, that are higher opportunity uh, than the places that they're forced to live in now and from which they were excluded when they were affordable. And that's, that's the subject of my next book. Excellent. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit how uh where African-Americans went then if they weren't allowed into these suburbs and these new uh, developments that the government was um, subsidizing and giving the money for. Uh, one of the things you mentioned are the multi-family homes and kind of a loan structure that was designed to kind of take the homes away from the people who moved into them. Well, I think you're referring to um... Uh, a process by which uh, as the African-American population expanded, uh, African-Americans uh, purchased homes in, um, in white neighborhoods that surrounded uh, black communities. And um, because it was to the advantage of white homeowners to sell to an African-American because African-Americans were willing to pay more for homes of similar quality than whites were willing to pay. Um, this was simply a question of supply and demand. 
the supply of homes available to African Americans was so small because of widespread discrimination that they're willing to pay much more. So when African Americans moved into white neighborhoods, uh, the uh, property values of those neighborhoods rose contrary to the myth because African Americans were paying more for those homes than whites were. And it was to the advantage of a white homeowner who maybe got a job in a different place or had a larger family wanted to move to sell to an African American rather than to a white. But then once a few African Americans moved into these communities and property values began to rise, speculators, first frequently real estate agents, but other speculators as well, descended on these communities to frighten white homeowners into selling their homes um, at uh, deeply discounted prices by persuading them, contrary to the evidence, that uh, their property values were going to decline if African Americans moved in. This is exactly the opposite of what was happening but they frightened homeowners into believing that property values were going to decline. Uh, in uh, my book, The Color of Law, I uh, quote a, um, a, uh, one of these speculators who wrote a national magazine article bragging that he had organized burglaries in a white neighborhood as a few African-Americans moved in to persuade whites that they better leave quickly. He hired uh, women, uh, black women pushing baby carriages around the neighborhood. He um, got the uh, people with uh, identifiable African-American dialect to call white homeowners and ask for somebody with a stereotypically African-American name. Is Johnny May there? To persuade whites that their community was swiftly turning to an all black community, completely opposite of what was happening. Well, uh, these tactics persuaded white homeowners to sell their homes at deeply discounted prices to these speculators, we call them blockbusters. And um, the blockbusters then turned around and resold those homes at highly inflated place, prices to African-Americans. Um, this was the blockbusting system. And this is how inner ring suburbs in many places turned from all white to all black. It was completely unnecessary and it was a, a, a violation of the constitution for state um, licensing agencies to license uh, real estate agents who engage in this kind of uh, behavior, but state licensing agencies did nothing to prevent it. Now I'm thinking about your question. You were talking about multifamily homes and now I realize what you were talking about. In African-American neighborhoods themselves in urban areas, African-Americans there too had to pay more for housing then whites would have had to pay for similar housing, again, for the simple supply and demand reasons that I talked about. They had no other choice uh, because the, the population was expanding and um, other areas were excluded from them. So African-Americans frequently had to subdivide their homes simply to make their payments uh, on the, the homes that they had uh, bought. And they became um, uh, two flats, uh, I don't know if you recall uh, uh, reading Michelle Obama's uh, autobiography, Becoming, but she lived upstairs in one of those two flats with her family from a, um, a family downstairs, a woman downstairs that uh, had to uh, rent out part of her home in order to make her payments because the prices of those homes were so high. Well, and also we can tie this to um, the subprime um, mortgage crisis that happened a couple of years ago, right? I mean, there's oh. a direct line. Uh, sure. Um, the subprime uh, crisis um, was uh, propelled in part by explicit racially discriminatory policy uh, on the part of banks and mortgage originators. Uh, the subprime crisis was um, created when uh, banks and realtors, and there are court cases in which um, affidavits uh, testified to these practices, banks decided to target African-American neighborhoods in particular for exploitative refinanced mortgage project products. Uh, they, these uh, products had um, exploding interest rates. This was perhaps the most egregious part of them. They had low teaser rates, the uh, salespeople, uh, bankers, and the uh, um, uh, uh, 
mortgage originators uh, advertise these um, uh, refinance loans with very, very low interest rates uh, to African-American homeowners in particular. Uh, but the small print had an exploding interest rate some years later, a few years later, so that when uh, African-American home buyers in particular, uh, it wasn't only African-Americans, but they were disproportionately targeted for these products. Um, when the three or four years later came around and suddenly their low interest rate exploded into a very high interest rate, they could no longer make the payments on these loans. Their properties were foreclosed the, uh, and um, throughout these neighborhoods, there were rows and rows of, of foreclosed properties of families that um, had succumbed to this exploitation. The uh, banks um, sent the uh, salespeople to black churches on Sunday, not to white churches, but to black churches on Sunday to promote these um, surprisingly low interest refinance loans and by which uh, people could take out a lot of money. The, the banks even pressed appraisers to overvalue the homes so that the African-Americans who uh, would succumb to this uh, would take out even larger loans. And the banks and mortgage originators um, paid no price for this because two government um, uh, agencies or quasi-government agencies, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, then bought the loans from the banks and the mortgage originators uh, so that the banks and mortgage originators now had funds to um, make out new loans like this. As I say, they sent the, some of these loans, the banks characterized them in internal uh, um, discussions as ghetto loans. Uh, and uh, many of them uh, were to people who qualified for regular conventional loans, but they weren't offered regular conventional loans. They were only offered uh, these subprime products. This was a cause or one of the chief causes, this kind of racial discrimination was one of the chief causes of the housing collapse uh, and the uh, financial collapse generally of uh, 2008 because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac then sold these loans themselves to speculators and uh, the speculators then sold and resold them and uh, eventually the chickens came home to roost and the, they weren't getting any payments uh, on these loans because the properties were foreclosed. Uh, and uh, we had the financial crisis followed. Well, I think that brings me to my last question, which is, um, you know, your thesis is is that the government really supported and and uh, encouraged this sort of process. So it plays into the Freddie and Fannie Mac, um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, narrative, because it even though Supreme Court cases were decided and and uh, against some of these practices, the agencies continue. And I, I guess maybe if you could kind of end with an overview of how the government really did uh, foster this segregation in apartheid. Well, um, I don't know of court decisions that prohibited this. Uh, there were a few lawsuits against the banks that engaged in this practice and they were settled with uh, some really minimal payments by the banks uh, to uh, you know, uh, African-American communities, not to necessarily, it did nothing to um, uh, enable the African-American families who lost their homes in this process to reoccupy uh, them. Uh, the government was actually absent in regulating this. The, the banks that engaged in this process were all supervised by the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, for example. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in its supervision um, was um, asleep at the wheel while these uh, practices, blatantly unconstitutional practices were prohibited. So um, I, don't, uh, I don't think there were any Supreme Court decisions that prohibited it. They didn't need for Supreme Court decisions to prohibit it. To have a program of ghetto loans doesn't need a new decision. It's a blatant violation of the 14th and Fifth Amendments to the Constitution that require a remedy. Uh, I'm working with a group of, let me say, conclude by saying this, I'm working with a group of national civil rights leaders uh, 
to uh, create a, uh, something they call a new movement to redress racial segregation that will place organizers in communities all around this country to try to create civil rights action to redress segregation uh, along these lines. Uh, if uh, any of your uh, library attendees want to find out more about uh, this uh, new movement, they can simply go to nmrrs.org that uh, those initials stand for the new movement to redress racial segregation, nmrrs.org. And they can um, sign up on a list to get information about it when it launches. It may very well have activity in Cleveland uh, uh, in its uh, early years. Uh, Cleveland and the Cleveland surrounding suburbs like Cleveland Heights are a uh, prime uh, place where segregation uh, needs to be redressed. 